Welcome to Just Energy Radio with your host, naturopath and medical intuitive, Dr. Reed Louise. We have learned from Einstein's theory that matter and energy are one. Physicists believe that all systems in nature have their own particular way of vibrating. From the swinging of a pendulum to the waves of the ocean to the light that brightens the sky each day, each of these oscillates at its own unique rate. The same holds true for every thought, feeling, event, or word we speak. Each has its own frequency or rate of vibration. What many of us don't realize is when we take everything in our universe down to its simplest form, it is all just energy. Join Dr. Rita Louise on a journey through time and space where past, present, and future collide. Today, what you believe may be called into question. What we want to know is, who made up the rules? Be brave and step outside the box. We are about to turn our world upside down and venture into the unknown. Hold on. We are departing our own beliefs and entering alternative realms. Enjoy the possibilities. And welcome to Just Energy Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Reed Louise, and thank you all for tuning into the show tonight. Oh, yet another great show. In the first hour, we're going to be speaking with my good friend Keith Blanchard about his new book, For the Love of God. I thought it was for the love of money, but I guess we're going to find out about God. I don't know. In the second hour, with Mary Sutherland about the redheaded giants. Just Energy Radio is brought to you by SoulHealer.com, where you can find out about the products and services I offer, including medical intuition evaluations, energy healings, and psychic readings. So if there's things going on in your life, you need some guidance and advice, give me a call, send me an email, and we can set up a time for a private consultation in person, by phone, and even via Skype chat. How cool is that? It's also brought to you by the Institute of Applied Energetics, where you can jumpstart your intuition today by downloading their free 50-page guide. You can do that by going to www.appliedenergeticsinstitute.com. One other quick announcement, and I'm going to be starting to talk about this every week as we move forward. Um, In about six months is the Paradigm Symposium being held in Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, paradigmsymposium.com, I think is the website. Check it out. You know, there are a lot of people that have asked me, well, when are you going to come out speaking or where are you speaking? And can I come hear you talk? I will be there speaking. Uh, good friends of the show are going to be there. Laird Scranton, uh, Ed Nightingale, who was on last week, uh, Scotty Roberts, John Ward, excellent speakers. It's going to be a great show. Check it out. Get your tickets today, uh, ParadigmSymposium.com. And if you haven't got your copy of Icon, we are in the, in the process of getting some digital copies made so you can actually purchase a disc off of the Just Energy Radio webpage, um, in addition to my ET Chronicles. So it's all good. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about Keith and let's get him on the air. Uh, best-selling author and composer Keith Blanchard. Um, well, let's see, and we're going to skip down here. In his late twenties, went through a crisis that stripped him of everything he held dear and left him with no choice but to turn inward for answers. In doing this, he found peace and stability. Uh, The peace and stability he wanted still eluded him. When he was 32, celestial beings began to appear to him, sharing glimpses of his future and the world. Not only did they enlighten and guide him, they instructed him to pass their message on to others so that they too could learn a higher way of living. His webpage is KeithAnthonyBlanchard.com, his book, For the Love of God. So please welcome Keith Blanchard. Hey, Keith, how's it going? Hello, hello. Fabulous. I'm here. (laughs) Well, that's a good thing. Yeah. You know, I always love having you come on the show because we have excellent conversations every time. Yeah, I look forward to it. I was looking forward to it all week, actually. I had to call you a little early on the phone just so I can hear your voice. I was getting so excited. (laughs) See, I knew (laughs) there was a ploy to that phone call. Uh, I knew it. And you weren't a telemarketer, and you weren't one of those recording things that say, oh, well, there are issues with your credit card, so you need (laughs) to call us. And it's like, huh? 
Keith. <laughs> <laughs> My calls now are attention seniors. <laughs> they, I, somehow they think I'm in my golden years, but I love I love the idea, but I'm just not quite there yet. Yeah, maybe when you're like 97, <laughs> they can they can start doing that, right? Yeah, righto. righto. When I got your book for the love of God and opened it, I read the forward and I thought, hey, this is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really appreciate your contribution to the to the book. Dr. Rita wrote the forward for him on your release for the love of God, and it was very uh, on point. I, I really thought it fit well. Well, and I have to tell you, I I was reading it. And I'm thinking, hey, this is pretty good. And then I was like, oh, wait a minute, I wrote this. <laughs> <laughs> right on, right on. And you know, it's interesting, when you asked me to write it and when I did write it, it was not long after Wayne had passed. And so I felt like I was in really not a great place. Um, but at this point in time, reading it again, I'm like, Hey, that was actually pretty good. Um, I mean, because I could feel where I was just in the energy of where I needed to be to provide you the words that needed to be in this book. Yeah, and it also um, set very well with me. And I think it created a really good tone for the book because, you know, talking about storms and calm seas and it's just a dynamic that the, the whole human race moves through. You know, at some periods of our life, sometimes we're okay and we get to hang out and really um, – Calm waters, still waters with nice skies and a nice breeze, but sometimes that wind gets a whipping <laughs> and, and those seas get a little choppy and so does your life. And it will humble you and put you on your knees and made you wish you have done the prayer work beforehand. <laughs> your platform has always been do what you love or love what you do. I don't know. I always get them backwards. But anyway, um, but even when you do what you love and love what you do, we still experience those rough waters periodically. You know, even if you have a great meditation practice, even if you pray, I mean, wouldn't you agree with that? Absolutely. Life is a series of com coming and goings. It's a series of goods and bads, lights and darks. And no matter, even for enlightened beings, um, all the work that I've read in my life, it states that you get to a place within yourself that this light, dark, good, bad, calm, turbulence just falls away because you become the peace. You become solid as a rock. So all that other stuff is just, just movement. You don't give it labels. And therefore, it takes on a new tone, a new dynamic. It doesn't have the, you know, I've gotten to a place in my life Think, thankful to a mentor of mine that whenever I would stub my toe or break something or hurt something on my body or something that physically hurt, instead of looking at this as, oh my God, this hurts and this is such amazing pain, I was able to shift to a state of this is just feeling, intense feeling, mind you, but it's just feeling. Um, and in changing that idea, um, it, it does a lot to the energy um, for the pain, uh, uh, for the return karma that would happen again. Um, but I, I, doing what you love doesn't necessarily mean that the woes of life are going to pass you by. You can bet on that. Do you find that when things that are challenging or that upset the cart or are difficult – to move through, do you find those experiences uh, cleansing, you know, even if you notice the cleansing in hindsight? Yeah, I would think that the difficult, the situation, that when you cross through the threshold, when you break on through to the other side, that's probably where your biggest growth lies in your life is when you become when you come up against these monumental places when you're because I'm using the word monu monumental it's that monumental for you to be able to break through and when you do you have the same result if something big is happening to you in your life that's not fun when you're able to move through that you're going to have the same bigness on the other side of rebirth, I would absolutely agree with that because uh, 1996, no, 1992, when I went through that relationship, 
for 10 years, and it brought me to my knees uh, for two years, uh, despair, depression. But I tell you what, when I got through the other side of that, as much darkness as I had playing with that energy, when that box opened, uh, it was just amazing for me. So I would agree that the, the, to the depth and to whatever degree the lesson, um, that when you, become, when you come clean on the other side, I think the, the reward would be equal. Well, I think, and I'd like your thought, that it gives us strength to overcome ch other challenges that we might, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, meet down the road. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it's sort of, it prepares you for whatever else may come. And I think that if you have a big issue and you're able to move through that and you come out smelling very nicely on the other side, when something equal or something lesser shows up it's it's a no-brainer it's, it's it's so much easier to be able to move through because you've done the work you know how to move through such thick issues such you know issues that have some density to them and you know the lighter ones just become even easier i know it's like oh my car blew up ah, okay <laughs> where <laughs> <laughs> i i, I you know, I'll just share this. You know, I've had periods where I've had everything blow up, break, fall apart within like a two week period, you know, and then when the microwave just goes, eh, 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 um, it's just like whatever. And now stuff breaks, you know, and it's like, OK, whatever. I mean, <laughs> there, you know, there's not there's not the emotional reaction that it used to get. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes, you know. I still have that right off the bat emotional reaction. I catch myself all the time. But doing the work that I have extensively and intensively, I, I've learned that as soon as something catches me by surprise and I go into that particular dynamic of uh, fighting it back, uh, I'm immediately on top of it. And I catch myself and I do the breath work and I breathe into it and I dissipate the energy immediately just by doing the breath, by getting the breath involved in the dynamic that I may be overwhelmed with at that moment. And you find that that helps you shift the energy, release the energy. What does that do for you? It makes me become friends with it. It makes me become conscious of it. It helps me to manipulate it. It helps me to move through it and dissipate it. If I find myself in an issue, I just got some news, um, some pretty solid news that is just going to move me for a while. Instead of judging it, at first, like I said, I may go to the, oh, no, God, uh, uh, whatever words I may use. Once I get through that, I go into <laughs> some good I, French. Huh? <laughs> yeah. And I, I let the energy that I'm feeling, I let it be. I let it be present. I don't try to ignore it. I don't try to um, stuff it down. I let it be present. In fact, I started. I start to um, excite it because I want to feel what it feels like. And then I go into, <gasps> and I breathe myself into oblivion, basically, until I intuitively um, know that no more breath surrounding this particular issue is required. And lo and behold, you will take miles and miles off of your journey or any of the issues that may show up in your life just by breathing your way through the issue. Excellent. And, and it sounds like that. I mean, it almost sounds like you're in labor or something. <laughs> well, as, believe it or not, that's actually kind of real. That's kind of true about the scenario because you are trying to rebirth yourself through a situation, a, an old paradigm. And, you know, I, I breathe like mad. I open my mouth very wide and I start moving energy. And what it does, it literally burns whatever the scenario is. Because if you have an energy that is present in your body or in your mind or in your life and it's of a denser nature, well, God breathed life through man. And if God is your breath, then obviously as you breathe and if you breathe with sincerity and intensity, <gasps> Then you are bringing all this light in your body because of the oxygen. You, you're, you're, you're becoming charged. And so anything that's present, darkness, in that moment, when it's brought to the light, it, it, it just has to dissipate. It's not rocket science. It's a very, very real, simplistic principle. And it can be that easy. Try it. 
I'm not going to do it right now. I'll wait no, for just the next general. thing to blow up. No. <laughs> you can't your microwave. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But yes, I guarantee uh, I have, I've suggested this to people for many years and they all come back with, oh my God, what an amazing piece of information. It's just a, it's more or less now that when something arises, remem- remembering that someone told you to do that becomes the issue. Um, because, you know, the next day you may say, oh, I forgot to breathe through that. But breathe. That's the key. Breathing's good. I like breathing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Keith, one of the things that I know about you is that you're an extremely passionate person. You, you know, I know that you're passionate about your music and you're passionate about your practice and you're passionate about your writing. Um, in your opinion, what are the elements? What what makes a person passionate? Wow. What makes a person passionate? Let me think that about about myself. What makes me passionate? I mean, because there are the things, but then there's like this fire or this light that just keeps them, you know, keeps it burning, I guess. I don't know. Believe it or not, I think ego has a lot to do with it. (laughs) Seriously. You know, people, okay. people on this anti-ego kick and spirituality, you know, you know, without an ego, you can't drive a car. Um, I'm, I've been playing rock music since I was a child. I love it. I love the feeling of getting on stage and people are digging what I'm doing. You know, self-image, it's fun. I don't use it out of balance. I use it to drive my car, to drive my life. Drive meaning passion. I'm passionate. I love having fun, and it just so happens my areas of fun happen to be in the limelight. I mean, I don't feel special above and beyond anybody else, but that's just where my gig is. Um, But what makes a person passionate? Fun. I think reward. Self reward, the what the what's going to happen on the outset when what you have done. You know, I, when writing The Divine Principle, writing For the Love of God, it's all been fun. From the first, from the, the, the preface, all the way to the epilogue, it was all just a blast. But that one feeling, when that UPS man knocks on the door, and you know you're waiting on that box. <laughs> and when I bust that box open, the feeling I had of 15 years of writing for the love of God, it, was, it came into fruition. All of it just came into this moment, um, this internal explosion, opening the box. It was a metaphor for me for opening something inside of myself that I've now saw comes, you know, become solidified. So what makes a person passionate? You know, I think uh, I think part of it could be in the genes. I think part of it could be in the alignment you have with Creator before you were born. Uh, there's a lot of different variables, but I think it's doing what you love. I think you have to find something. You know, it's very simple. It's, again, it's not rocket science. If God is love, when you do what you love, you are in alignment. You become a vessel. Prosperity and abundance and happiness by law becomes the response. It's not that difficult. No one wants to get up and go to a job that they have to work 40, 50, 60 hours, you know, just to make money and they they hate it. I mean, you you can't have any quality of life because now you're grumbly. You come home from work. You take it on the wife. The wife takes it on the kids. The kids take it out on each other. They bring that stuff to school. Where's the passion? Where's the drive? Where's the where's the desire to live? Other than existing. So when you find what you love to do and you make that a part of your daily life, even if it's in small doses at first, the reward is so far beyond money. And then when you get really good at your passion, because no one is like you, you're unique at what it is you do. Even if it's the same thing that other people do, you're doing your part better than anyone else. Your value, your appreciation value goes through the roof. And now you become something that everybody wants a part of. And then prosperity, abundance, wealth, affluence becomes a natural part of the response, part of the law. I've seen so many young people that just seem passionless. Have you noticed that as well? I've seen my share. That's for sure. What's your take on that whole thing? You know, do you think, 
I don't even know what, I mean, I think that they have no passion, but I don't really understand why not. Do you have any thoughts on that? Any insights? Yeah. One word, parents. <laughs> Seriously. Okay. You, if, Explain. If, if, if your parent, <clears throat> if your parent or parents or responsible for instilling everything in you that is going to shape you into the being that you're going to be in the future when they are able legally and feel that it's time that they are no longer responsible for your life. I think it's parents. They are the biggest influence. They are God to you. I mean, parents stand over their children. They tower over these children. Um, you know, we were talking in the radio green room just a little bit ago about my son, um, how people say, wait till he turns a teenager, Keith, that's all going to change. I don't buy into it because I am giving him the foundation, the groundwork. I'm giving him the power. I'm teaching him about what real power is. He, at the age of 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, he's going to be a wizard. <laughs> he's going to be able to create that, what, what he wants the rest of his life. And I'm not teaching him how to go out and get a job. I'm not teaching him, you better go get a job. None of, none of these old ways of thinking. I'm just giving him the power and explaining to him that there is no right and wrong. There is no good and bad. All there is is consequent of, consequence of choice. And he understands it. He gets it. And so I think it's parents. And now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of other things involved. You have uh, why did you incarnate into that family, blah, 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 karmic reasons or whatever, and so on, uh, so on and so forth. But I think parents uh, can really change and shape the child's life because if the parents gave the child the empowerment, the confidence they need, maybe, maybe this particular child goes to school and is being bullied or picked on so they'd have no confidence. Where Passion is all about confidence. Hmm. Interesting correlation. I mean, my son chose the hard road. You know, it was like, let's be confrontational about everything. And so his consequence was he would have to read self-help books and write reports. Hmm. He worked through the bulk of my library. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you what, it must have done some good because now all of his friends go to him and talk to him mm. to get advice. It's like, well, I guess it was good you read all those books. <laughs> So, see, even in that ad advers adversarial or, you know, in his adversary. Now, anyway, you know, there was a blessing in disguise. Anyway. Yeah. Moving on, moving on. Um, Going to sh shift topics here. You had the opportunity to spend time in India with a holy man, Sri Baba. Um, why, why did you seek him out? Why go to India? <sighs> He contacted me. He came to me in a dream. Uh, Sati Sai Baba I learned about his presence in 98, and he started coming to me in dreams. And uh, out of all the books I've read about his life, you know, he doesn't write books. People like doctors and scientists and people who don't believe in this sort of thing, they went over there to see what all the hype was. And they come back, and these are the people writing these books, <laughs> saying, you know, I don't know what that is over there. It does. It, it's far beyond my understanding of what I thought even possible in the form of a human being. And so the common denominator throughout all these books I read was he said that um, if I come to you in a dream, you're not dreaming. I am truly present. Well, after coming to me for about a year and a half or so, in my dreams, uh, he came to me in one particular night. He's standing across a river. <clears throat> and he starts to speak to me telepathically. And he says, Keith, I want you to come to India to see me on the ashram. And I said, I would love that, but I've never done such a thing. In fact, I've never left, left the country. Where would I do this? Where would I get the money? How? And he says, Keith, you need to put your doubt and disbelief aside. Get rid of your human logic. Come here to put your feet on Indian soil. Turn around and go home if you must do that. But at least take that step for me. So I wake up in the morning, figuring out how I'm going to do this. I said, you know what? I'm just going to let this go. Two weeks later, I get a phone call from a lady I've never met. Hi, Keith. My name is Debbie. Um, we have a mutual friend, and I hear you want to go to India to see Holy Man. I said, yes, this is true. She goes, Keith, I'm a flight attendant. 
I got some companion passes for the year that are about to expire. And I would not like that to happen knowing you want to go to India to see a holy man. Can I give you a first class round trip ticket? So uh, three months just later. Just like that. Just, just like that. Out of the it just as, as you could say, it manifested out of the blue. Uh, I, I tell you, it happened verbatim on my son. That is exactly what happened. I get the call three months later. I'm on a plane bound for India. Um, I get to the ashram. While I'm on my pilgrimage, I brought a tape recorder and I logged everything, everything. Um, and I and when I wrote it in the book, uh, For the Love of God, even though that's been in the year 2000, I kept, and I'm sure you probably noticed this, but I kept my trip while I was in India in present tense because I, I wanted the book to have an impact as if you were truly there experiencing this through my eyes and through through my my feeling sensors. Um, but while I was there, uh, I saw, felt, experienced, intuited, had miraculously happened the most amazing things that most people will never see in a lifetime. I saw this happen daily. Um, you know, there's a lot of bells and whistles surrounding when I talk about Sai Baba that he can manifest. And people's like, well, yeah, Keith, we know people can do that. And that's all cool. And that's all the flashy stuff. But what about the substance? Trust me, if there's a man on this planet that can manifest at will, there is substance there. Um, it was just probably one of the highlights other than my son and my trip to Hawaii, being in a rock band, playing there for two months. It was one of the highlights of my life. In fact, it was probably the highlight that expanded me to the level I now know as myself and very blessed about it. What was it like to be in the presence of a holy man like that? You know, and I'm looking more for a feeling sensory yeah. kind of response, I guess. Yeah. Um, I felt what it was like to be him, and I'll tell you why. Because if you go there, no, well, I would say even if you don't know, something will happen to you. If you go there with an inkling or just an idea that this person could be what it's said he is as to why you would go there in the first place. You're going to have such amazing humility <laughs> come about you. And believe me, when you see him, when you see the ex all of it, something inside happens. Something inside happens. You become so humbled, you know that your thoughts are being read. You know there's nothing this being does not know about you. So why put on a facade? Why fight it? Why go against the grain? You just, you just humble yourself and allow yourself to be seen. You become visible. And in that humility, Dr. Rita, in that humility and in that, what is the other word I'm looking for? Uh, vulnerability. In that humility is where God lives. God lives in that humility. And I was able to humble myself enough to where I was able to feel what it's like to be him. When he walks into the temple, you feel it. You feel it. You have 35, 40,000 people there on an average day. What? Wait a minute. Say yeah. what? Uh, okay. 35, 40,000 people. I mean, that's like a rock concert size. Yes. And this you're, is an You're thinking day. to yourself, man, if I could just get that kind of turnout when I'm playing, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, that many people there on an average day, on a festival day, Mahashivaratri Festival, 250,000 people on his birthday, 250,000 people. But while I'm there, let's say, let's say a low number, 35,000 people. When this little five foot one man who never leaves the, never left the ashram. He's passed now. He passed on Easter morning uh, in 2011. When this little man walks through this gate, five foot one, and 35,000 people's excuse to be there is to see him, when he comes through that gate, 35,000 collective conscious people, one pointed focus is on this image. And when this little man walks in, he, it's like he's gliding I'm serious. It's like he's gliding on water. And you know within you that this is how divinity acts and behaves, walks and talks. There is an unspoken agreement. There's an unspoken power. When he walks into that 
Kuwant Hall, that temple, you feel it. 35,000 collective people. You, it, the energy becomes palpable. You can almost physically touch it. That's what it's like. Wow. And when he turns his hand, he's about to materialize something. <clears throat> Excuse me, be it ash, uh, a coin, a watch, or a ring, and you can bet whoever he's going to give this to, it fits perfectly when it's manifested. It may, it's, it's just amazing. But when he starts turning his hand, and everybody's watching, you can feel the consciousness shoot through the roof. And I often thought, like in Star Wars, use the force around you. Is Sai Baba drawing from 35 plus thousand people's one pointed focus attention and using his will to create detail? In other words, he's using that power, that energy to manifest whatever he's manifesting because when I was on the ashram and he began to do those manifestations, it felt like we all went to the place where the object came, the, the object came from and brought it back together. <laughs> so what you're saying is that what he's doing is taking all that energy and then channeling it and making something manifest into the physical? I'm not saying that is what he's doing, but that is but that's what, that, it feels what it felt like, like to me. Mm -hmm. it, it, it felt familiar to me is the best way to describe it. It felt like, I know this place. I know what he is doing. I know it's real because I feel the energy passing through me, and yet it's manifesting before my eyes. Wow, wow. And you see, and, and when you're there, you don't only see him. You feel the power of 35,000 people sitting in lotus position all around you. Not only do you feel that, you peripherally feel that. You see that. You smell that. You hear it. You become so aware, so peripherally heightened, and it goes from top to bottom, you know, bones to bones. It's so multidimensional. Um, you know, I wish there was, you know, a technology now that when you read a book that you can actually put your finger on a sensor and feel what, what it was like to be there. That would be really cool. Could you spend a couple of minutes and tell his story for the listeners? And, you know, because you said that you've read some books about him, but what's his story that even drew your attention to him in the first place? Well, I was new on the spiritual path when I when I learned of his presence. Um, I was teaching a spiritual class. In fact, I called it Spirituality 101 at the Connection Center here in Memphis. And at the end of my class, a friend of mine came up and we were talking and came up on the podium where I was standing. We were just uh, bullying around and we started talking about some of the pictures that were on the wall. They had a wall full of pictures of deities, everything from Mother Teresa to Gandhi to Buddha to Krishna to Christ and blah, blah, blah. And Sai Baba was actually the last in the lot. And I said, well, what's this guy? And what's his claim to fame? What's his mission? He says, Keith, see this right here? And he reaches down on the altar and he pulls out this little bowl, this little canister, and he shows me this Vibhuti ash that Sai Baba spontaneously manifests at will out of his hand. And I've seen this manifest on pictures that nobody ever touches. It just ma magically just shows up and it falls off. And it will fall off and stay there forever and if unless you touch it. Once you touch the picture, it'll stop. But being new in the spiritual path, I was at that place in my life where things were not good. And I wanted to learn because I knew that people can become masters, they can spontaneously manifest. And when I heard he was able to do that, I knew that was my path. That's the direction I'm going. I want to be able to manifest a life of bliss and passion with ease. And if he's the master and he's doing it, then obviously he's my teacher and that's why I'm going to beat my feet. I started buying books <clears throat> and I started reading every book I can find about his life. And things started happening. Things started happening in my home. Uh, he would become present. You go, oh, Keith, that you just. No. <laughs> he became present in my home, blowing out candles, lighting candles, uh, coming to me in dreams, bringing me to India, no expense to me. Um, but my passion and my love for him, believe it or not, after my trip to India, it never changed as far as the level of devotion and who he is to me. But him, me placing him on on the altar as. God changed because my trip to India was successful in that it helped me to see myself that way. Because when I was in India, I was truly 
open up to that level within myself to where I was actually able to experience that. And it didn't come from him. It didn't come, you know, I wasn't inside of him. It happened inside of me. But my reverence is still there with, you know, absolute um, appreciation and reverence just for the manifestation of this holy man. And of course, that is his goal as well. He doesn't want anyone to see him as this uh, divine figure, which he is. And but he will also play the other side of that, which is, um, you know, don't come to me. If you if you come to me, I called you. If not, you know, look within yourself. It's it's not necessary that you go to India, unless there's a purpose. And I didn't know what that purpose was, except for my growth and to come back and spread this message of unity, which is my new gig, Dr. Rita. I'm all about the message of unity uh, throughout the world. That is my new window and the work that I am pushing now. Have uh, have other people that you've met or that were at the ashram have the same uh, calling situation where they saw him in their dreams or felt very connected to him prior to um, coming to India? Yeah. In fact, um, yes, all the time I hear people talk about, I know this lady by the name, in fact, she's a friend of mine, Dr. Shelley, don't remember her last name. She read a little bit about Sai Baba, kind of got interested. Then she left it alone. She understood it. She was in Florida visiting a friend. Didn't tell anyone. <laughs> and the phone rings and her friend says, uh, Shelly, it's for you. She goes, well, how can that be? No one knows I'm here. She answers the phone and it's like, Bobble. <laughs> what? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I have a fr dear friend of mine by the name of Sharon who lives here in Memphis. Uh, she's had some pretty powerful, phenomenal manifestations happen in her house with a mirror. Um, a, you know, mirror is what? Silver. Looks like foil. Hers turned completely gold. Uh, with Vubuti ash all over it, and so they sealed it with a, a glass pane, so it's forever gold, and it's forever s sealed this ash that's in there. But yes, people have uh, dream experiences with him all the time. In fact, um, when I first started to dream about Sai Baba, my mind was only registering it as Deepak Chopra. If you look at Sai Baba's face and Deepak Chopra's face side by side, it's uncanny. Absolutely uncanny. But I know it was Sai Baba, not Deepak Chopra. And as far as a dream metaphor, my mind was doing that, making it Deepak Chopra, is because of the experience that was transpiring when it looked like Deepak Chopra. My mind didn't know of Sai Baba, so it found the nearest likeness. Or, you know, I'm sure I'm absolutely emphatic about it that Sai Baba could have made me see him. But for whatever acclimation reasons, I don't know. But yes, I hear people all the time. And I, I, I now because of this book, I visit a lot of the Sai Baba centers. And I hang around, around a lot of Indians. And let me tell you, their devotion to this avatar and the Leelas, which translates to divine uh, play or sport that transpires in their life, is amazing. Um, this India happens in their house all the time. And when I say India, I mean the miracles and the manifestations. This happens in their house all the time because you have a, a whole family unit who is behind this conviction, this consciousness. Um, <laughs> and when I go over there, uh, you, I, I'm back in India again. I can feel it. Does Sai Baba have a message or is it more being in his presence that you're able to raise your vibration because you're creating a resonant resonant harmony with him yeah i i think it's both uh his message is if anytime you read some of the sai baba stuff you may see some pictures you'll see one of his message in fact in uh hard rock cafe um one of the the major players behind the hard rock cafe movement is a sai baba devotee um is love all serve all um Love all serve, help ever, hurt never. So these are kinds of his his little phrases. But and now this is really hard for people to grasp. And I'm not here to push beliefs on you. I'm here to tell you what I know to be honest, solid, and real in the truth as I know it. And if I can brag a little bit, I can see. I can see. I, I am not a fool. Uh, I'm not blind. Uh, it's hard to pull something over on me because I'm very peripherally aware. I, I'm intuitive. I can feel. I can see with my eyes what your eyes are doing. I, I, I'm, I can see. 
the manifestation of this avatar that left three years ago, you know, Jesus was a uh, yogi, Buddha was a yogi, uh, Paramahansa was a yogi. We're all yogis. We're beings that, are, that aspire to godhood. People like Buddha and Yeshua and the like, they have made it. So they became one with God through the course of their life uh, through spiritual sadhanas or practices. Sai Baba is an avatar, which means he was not born in the sense that he, over the course of his life he became one with God. He was born with God consciousness. Sai Baba is a pillar of light from the Godhead shining down on this planet that explodes in this array of amazing bursts of consciousness light that was housed in a five foot one body. A Mahavatar by the name of Babaji and others. They're not born at all. They just pop out a body anywhere they like and just begin to live through it. But Sai Baba is a full manifestation of the Godhead. Sai meaning mother. Baba, as Abba in the Bible, means father. So Sai Baba, Sathi of Sai Baba is, Sathi is truth, Sai, mother, Baba, father. So he is the truth. He is the absolute truth. In fact, he known by people as Paramahansa Yogananda and other high-level spiritual gurus that Baba is the highest incarnation of God to have ever walked on the face of this earth. That's you a mean big like That's higher a big than statement. Rama and higher than uh, Krishna and all it, of them? Yes, but it's not so much that one can actually be higher than the other. I don't mean that if one is bigger, better, higher, bigger muscles, anything like that. It's not that at all. It means more of the level of endowment, more of, I, I, I can't explain it, it's, it's the Godhead personified in the form of Sai Baba. Baba was Krishna, Baba is Yeshua. Uh, you know, it's all the same, but to that degree of spiritual manifestation and divinity, it is supposedly the highest incarnation to have ever walked on this earth. Does he have a Mercedes Benz? Uh, I <laughs> no, he has a Rolls Royce. <laughs> okay, well, I'm just a checking. Bentley. I mean, you know, thirty thousand people showing up every day. I mean, they come do, on. They, he did get uh, chauffeured around. There was a car. I likely doubt it was a Mercedes Benz, but yeah. Um, da, 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 da. Did you ever get to spend any, you know, with 30,000 people or 40,000 people, with all those people, did you ever get to spend any time with him? Uh, there's there's a fortunate few, maybe 10 per blessing. He comes out twice a day, 10 per darshan, per blessing. He will point to, and it means you're lucky. You are a really lucky individual. Uh, he'll bring you in the back room and give you an interview. Um, he'll, and, and enter and enter interview as well he'll tell you about your life tell you what's important what you need to know about your life what you need to work whatever it is i hadn't had that opportunity uh in that way uh but i've had amazing things happen by him looking at me talking to me telepathically touching my hands blessing beads because i was in the beating hot sun for hours praying on this bead uh you know you have to read the book and it, that's not a plug or a a, a, a pitch um, there's just too much in, you know, this hour show to convey, you know, we think that talking, and I know, I know you know better, but talking happens uh, communicatively with our mouth. But when you are able to go to India and experience something or wherever it is you may be, to that level of awareness, talking happens in many, many different forms. And that's just not an escape from your question. That really is the truth. That when you're plugged into something that is omnipresent, and the only way you can understand omnipresence is to somewhat be that yourself, then a different form of communication begins to happen in many, many different ways. And, and I don't mean this as like a, a judging question, but as you looked around the room with the people that you were in the ashram with at these blessings, uh, were you surrounded by a whole group of spiritually aware individuals or was it like anywhere else that there was just kind of a blend with some very advanced people and some that came because they just did? 
I think that's true. I think I think it's all true. I think it was a hodgepodge. I think there was very um, very spiritual enlightened people. There were priests. There were Buddhist monks, Tibetan monks. I mean, uh, government officials. Uh, you can you can tell because. Y- if you've done a significant amount of spiritual work on yourself and you have some intuition about you, as when you're in the ashram, your intuition automatically heightens. So as you're walking around and you're meeting people and seeing people passers by, you kind of have an immediate intuitive spark and notion about who they are, where they're from, and you know how endowed they may be. And some people will just knock you on your butt easily. And I met this... I'm guessing seven-year-old, eight-year-old little boy. When I was in the ashram, he's from England, a little Asian boy. His name was Elijah. Oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, this little boy was put in front of me by Sai Baba. I'm telling you, there's no other way it could be. Um, We were playing ball. He called down to me from my balcony and said, would you come down and play ball with me? I said, sure. And myself and my roommate, Darmir, from Croatia, um, coincidentally, had the same birthday, <laughs> and I asked him if he wanted to come down here and toss the ball with this uh, little boy with me. He said, "Sure," and I could not stop looking at this kid. The ball was being passed to me, and it kept hitting me in my head because I was just <laughs> too enamored of watching this the light from this little boy. It's it's just truly amazing. But yes, it, it was a mixture of all kinds of people. You just and a lot of them were just people who were just curious, and a lot of people were serious about being there and were willing to take every morsel they possibly could from this experience and, you know, milk it for what it's worth and use it for the rest of their life. Absolutely. I mean, it just is very interesting. I, I mean, even in the book, I don't know that I realized there were that many people that were in attendance on a daily basis. And I know that you stayed there for two weeks, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Two weeks. I mean, did they have? Did you stay in a hotel? See, now I, I'm just getting like into this whole men, mega <laughs> logistic thing. You know, did you stay in a hotel or did you stay at the ashram? And did they actually have housing for that many people? I did not know what to expect. I read a book called uh, Spirituality and Sai Baba, just a real thin, <clears throat> excuse me, book about what to expect, what not to expect. And when I got there, um, I. He drove me right into right up to the orientation office, and he said, you, you here with someone? I said, no, I'm alone. He said, I'll partner you up with someone. It cost me <laughs> a dollar, American money now, uh, translated, American money, it cost me a dollar a day to stay in a room that was like a Motel 6. You open the door, to your right is a full shower, toilet, closed-in bathroom, a recessed closet for hanging clothes, two amazing cots, everything you ever needed. It cost me a dollar a day, and I stayed right in the ashram. And my walk to Kulwat Hall to see and spend time in when Bob was given darshan, again, that means blessing, um, eight-minute walk on the ashram, beautiful layout, it's all gorgeous, everything's trimmed and neat, the, the, the greenery and birds, and oh my gosh, it's just heaven on earth. So what did you do when you weren't um, at the blessing things? Walking out on the street when it said you're not supposed to. <laughs> to buy. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's an understatement. To buy all the things I could possibly buy, to bring home, to share with friends, and to build a shrine in my home, which I did. Uh, posters and Joppa malas and this gold chain that I still wear around my neck that has never come off except one night when I was sleeping I woke up to find it off of my neck and clasped <laughs> I couldn't figure out how that happened um, but I would walk around the streets I would go uh, to where Sai Baba was born about a mile or so down the road um, there's so much to do in the ashram a meditation tree a museum and just it, the people in the courtyard were my favorite just to meet people and see what life was like for them, where they come from, and why they were there, and just to experience that particular individual. Cool. I mean, you know, there's seeing Sai Baba, and then there's the rest of the experience, which I'm sure was an experience by itself. And i tell you what, in all honesty, I enjoyed meeting those people as much as I enjoyed 
seeing Sai Baba come out of that little room every day. I I thoroughly enjoyed it equally. Some of the one of my most fond memories of being in the courtyard when I had some downtime away from the whole Baba blast with light experience. Uh, I was sitting there and with a gentleman who I just sat next to, and we, we striked up a conversation about Jesus. And it was just quite beautiful. The, this conversation was fine in and of itself. And after he, ha- he left, and for a little while later, there was this Indian man sitting on a big boulder, about eight feet away, uh, six feet away, close enough to hear a conversation. He was in meditation. And after the guy left, <clears throat> about five minutes later, he, he was silent as can be. About five minutes later, he said, Saidam, can I tell you about the Jesus Christ that we know here in my country? I said, absolutely. And the story he told me leveled me. It had, <laughs> it did not sound nothing. It didn't sound anything like what we heard here. In short, what he said, he says, let me set up what I'm about to tell you. He says, if there was something that happened in your neighborhood, would you likely believe the people in your neighborhood who was close enough to the experience, or would you believe the people across town? Neighborhood. Yeah. He said, then trust me when I tell you, you know nothing of Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so was he of the belief, you know, because there are people that speculate that Jesus spent his you know, from 12 to 30 in India, or are they saying that the whole Jesus story actually came out of India and then just kind of got picked up in the Middle East? I I think he meant it, definitely meant it to be funny, but I think it was all inclusive, meaning that, you know, some of your ideas about Yeshua are true, but in the grand scheme of things, you really, your country, your Bible, whatever, you really don't have a grasp on the energy and the manifestation of Yeshua and who he was. You know, that he did go to India. He did go to the Himalayas. He, you know, the Buddhist monks there knew he was coming and so forth and so on. But it was just, it was magical to hear his humor and the way he chimed in. He didn't chime in immediately. He waited till it was the right moment. And th- it was just always in India, it was like I was, it was like a song was being played everywhere I went. And now I understand why they call India the motherland. It's just truly enlightening. Hmm. Um, what would you say you took away from this experience in the big picture? I think the most powerful miracle that happened when I was in India, of course, Sai Baba, you know, I can actually say, and I, I'm for myself, and I'm saying this now to myself, that I in my lifetime saw God manifested physically. That being said, and the miracle of that, that being said, the, the other miracle that I feel is equally as powerful and equally as important as to why I am now my message with the radio show that I'm going to be doing, hopefully, um, that I've been doing. But my new message now with my work, my presentations, is about unity. I've been charged by a holy man recently, in the last couple months ago, a divine man, who's be- a yogi who became self-enlightened uh, by the name of Viswamji Visyogi. Um, he told me about my past lives, told me a few other things, and he charged me with a mission. Um, the most powerful, other than seeing Sai Baba and the miracle of that, was seeing 35,000 people from all walks of life live in harmony. Coexist in harmony. It was so magical to see. The respect. You haven't been to a Grateful Dead concert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but they were they were there. I mean, it's just, and agreed. It's the same sort of the same idea. But they were there, and they were salivating. They were passionate. They were sincere. There was such an amazing respect. They used the word "sidam," which means God. It means thank you. It means please. It means excuse me. It's just an endearment. Um, an unspoken. I mean, you don't have to know the meaning. You know how it's being applied when it's spoken. It's truly. It was truly a paradise, and 
just the energy there in and of itself was, I think, what the world is going, is moving to and is going to manifest to. And I just hope that uh, as many people who choose to be on board the Heaven on Earth Prophecy, you know, get your ticket and get on board because it's going to happen. It's happening now. A lot of people looking at the fear in the world, the, the anxiety in the world, the stress in the world, the troubles of the world. I don't live in that world. I don't. Okay, so what world do you live in? A passionate one, as you so said. I live in a peaceful one. I live in an appreciative one. I live in a fun one, I'll tell you that. I live in a musical one. I live in one where I'm, I'm blessed to be with some of the most amazing people. Everyone I meet, and they actually don't have a choice. I, I win the argument every time, even though it's not an argument. You will be my friend. You don't have to like it. <laughs> we are friends. <laughs> We are friends, and there, there really is nothing you can do about it. Oh, man. And I was trying to, like, get rid of you. <laughs> Dang. Yeah. I'm stuck with you? <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one final question, because we're getting to the end. You know, there's your mission, but inside, how has it changed your life? It helped me to touch a place, a space, a grace within myself that probably I would have not if it wasn't for that experience. Because what I needed was the humility to go there and to stop, to stop my brain, to stop my mind, to stop what I know as life here and go somewhere and be stripped down to the bare essentials, which was humility and grace and reverence and vulnerability and just let go and say, you know, I'm yours. Whoever you are, be it you in the physical, be it you above, and I'm just using the physical as the excuse. I'm using this time in India in front of all these people as my excuse to do that. And that's, that's what it did for me. It helped me to expand. Uh, I was expanded. He touched my prayer bead, and I saw the birth of the universe in, in so doing. And it wasn't with, like, physical sight. It was a different way of seeing. It was a more of a knowing that was so encrypted and multi-layered. But, it, you know, it's like it, taking a deep breath. <gasps> and when you expand yourself that big, you've touched that width. You've touched that degree of yourself. And you can never undo it. So I, 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 it still walks around with me. It's kind of like now that I had a glimpse of it, I have to do the work for the rest of my life to try to get back to that place that I know, I know what it feels like. But it's very, very subtle. But it's very, very powerful. So I guess the rest of my life is just to do what's required, be it work or be it letting go of work and ideas that I have in my head and or, and or finding a balance and becoming the embodiment of the best human being I can possibly be. Well, and that is all we can really do. Yeah. Anyway, our time is up. If somebody wants to get a copy of your book for the love of God with the forward by Dr. Reed Louise, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where can they get it? You can go to KeithAnthonyBlanchard.com, KeithAnthonyBlanchard.com, or you can get it at Amazon or Barnes & Nobles, whatever your choice. It's For the Love of God, A Spiritual Journey. But if they get it off your website, does it come signed and autographed and like have the secondhand touch of Sai Baba <laughs> on it? <laughs> no, only because the website is basically just a hub for the Amazon link. But go to the website because there's lots of other really cool stuff there. And it's not a sales pitch. There's a lot of really cool stuff to look at. I'm the, look, I, I'm the guy that you can get on his website. You can email me. And you can bet I will email you back likely the same day. I am not untouchable. I'm the guy next door. Um, that, you know. <laughs> And I have no compunction whatsoever. You know, if I just met you to come sit at your table and start digging in your French fry basket and just start helping myself. Yeah, I could see you doing that. <laughs> but, we, yeah. but we need to go, Keith. So I am going to say adieu. I, I appreciate you. Thanks, Dr. Uh, I love you. So you be love good. You. And I will talk to you again soon. Peace.
Okay, that's Keith Anthony Blanchard. His website is KeithAnthonyBlanchard.com. His book is For the Love of God. I'm Dr. Rita Louise, and we'll be back after these words from our sponsors. Just Energy Radio with your host, Dr. Rita Louise, will return right after these messages. Listening to IRN, the Inception Radio Network, Chicago, Illinois. Illinois. Are you looking for a cure for boredom? Never worry. IRN's new interactive website introduces a number of ways to pass time while you listen to your favorite show. Choose anything from the IRN chat lounge, the game lounge, video lounge, or the mood lounge. These fun, exciting features let you chat in real time with fellow listeners, view live sky watches, play daily posted online games, or pick a show based on topic. The choices are endless. Use your time wisely, keeping it all on IRN. Who were the gods of antiquity? They've been described as the forces of nature, levels of consciousness, and aspects of our psyche. Stories that depict their incredible weapons, their flying machines, and their amazing adventures are characterized as being the product of our ancestors' fanciful imaginations. But what if the tales of the gods are true? Did the writers, chroniclers, and scribes of our distant past actually document a realistic view of our origin? My latest book, Man Made, The Chronicles of Our Extraterrestrial Gods, looks at our most ancient legends. Learn of the torrid romances, elaborate plots, violent scandals, and conspiracies that played out in antiquity. Find out the role the gods played in the life and culture we have today. If you want to find out the truth of who we are and where we come from, order your copy of Man Made today. For more information, go to www.manmadethechronicles.com. That's www.manmadethechronicles.com. Hello, Inception Radio Network listeners. This is Amanda. Remember, you can take your Inception Radio shows on the go. Just download the Inception Radio Network app for your iPhone, iPad, or Android smartphones and access live shows, past shows, guest lineups, and much more. Just visit the iTunes Store or the Google Play Marketplace and download it today for free. Move past the crossroads in your life and discover alternative solutions to your deepest concerns at SoulHealer.com. So whether it's a physical problem, an emotional issue, a question about work, or troubles in your relationships, naturopath and medical intuitive Dr. Rita Louise can help you bring peace, harmony, and health back into your life. Schedule a session today. Visit SoulHealer.com right away and live the life you've been dreaming of. You didn't forget what's coming up tonight, did you? Hi, Inception Radio Network listeners. This is Amanda. Never miss that interview you were looking forward to or the show on your favorite topic. Follow IRN on Twitter, I underscore, R underscore N, and get reminders about the evening's live shows as well as fun and important updates throughout the week. That's I underscore, R underscore N, and never miss a great show again. We only have a couple of seconds before we have to get back to the show, and I want to tell you how you can jumpstart your intuition today. Using my free 50-page introductory guide filled with simple, revolutionary, and proven techniques, you can ignite your intuition and tap into your inner wisdom, all from the comfort of your own home. The Institute of Applied Energetics is the leader in online home study instruction for those interested in becoming a certified medical intuitive, intuitive counselor, or energy medicine practitioner. Now is the time to transform your life and take it to a completely new level. Discover who you are and how you work. Open the door to the world of intuition, health, and healing. You can jumpstart your intuition right away by going to www.appliedenergeticsinstitute.com and downloading our free guide. Get the opportunity of a lifetime and live the life you deserve. 
Download your free Jumpstart Your Intuition Guide today at www.AppliedEnergeticsInstitute.com and begin living a life filled with passion and purpose. Don't have a computer? Is your internet connection down? Don't worry. Use your trusty cell phone or landline and call into our listen line at 401-283-6700 to listen to the Inception Radio Network 24-7. Again, that call-in number is 401-283-6700. For the Inception Radio Network, I am MJ. Go deep inside yourself and venture into the realm of the unconscious mind with my Meditating on the Kabbalah guided imagery audio CDs. Discover who you are and what you want in life. Meditating on the Kabbalah can help you to open, clear, and revitalize the energetic pathways of your subtle being. They will support you in your spiritual quest by helping you to access the profound insights and inner guidance you need as you work in alignment with your highest good. Let them help you to release negative thoughts and emotions and clear away any limitations that may be keeping you from experiencing your full potential. Walk down the path to health, healing, understanding, and enlightenment with Meditating on the Kabbalah. Order your copy today at www.soulhealer.com. That's right, that's www.soulhealer.com. Hello, Inception Radio Network. Would you like your favorite show to be played again live on air? Well, now the choice is in your hands. With IRN's live request portal, an easy way to request your favorite show with a simple click. IRN's live request portal now gives you exclusive access to all the shows. How easy is it? Simply type a show name or a guest name, click request, even write a dedication message, and that's it. Try it now. Simply visit InceptionRadioNetwork.com, click on the live request tab under the show menu. Now playing your favorite show is just a mouse click away. And now back to Just Energy Radio with Dr. Rita Louise. Hello and welcome back to Just Energy Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Louise, and thank you all for staying tuned to the second hour of the show. Just Energy Radio is brought to you by SoulHealer.com where you can find out about all the products and services I offer, as well as the Institute of Applied Energetics, where you can jumpstart your intuition today by downloading their free 50-page guide. Haven't you ever wanted to change your career and work in the arts of healing and health? Well, maybe becoming a certified medical intuitive, intuitive counselor, or a certified energy medicine practitioner is right for you. Please check out the training at www.AppliedEnergeticsInstitute.com. Dot com. In this hour, we're going to be speaking with Mary Sutherland about her book, The Red-Haired Giants. Let me tell you a little bit about Mary and we'll get her on the air. Mary Sutherland is an author and researcher focusing her work on consciousness studies, ancient history, and unusual phenomena. She is a hands-on researcher and the creator of one of the largest websites on the internet with hundreds of pages providing information on the paranormal, UFOs, ancient race and their cultures, sacred sites and PowerPoints of the world, underground tunnels and cave systems. Boy, there's a lot of stuff. Dimensional world, metaphysics, etc. So please welcome to, to the show, Mary Sutherland. Hey, Mary, how are you? How are you, Rita? I am wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on. And I'm, you know, I, I want to apologize on air for not having you on sooner, but I saw you, somebody posted your book or you posted your book on Facebook and that was the first I heard about it. And then well, I was like, wait a minute, you got to get on the show. <laughs> well, you're in Australia, right? No, I'm in Texas. Oh, you're in Texas. I thought that you said that you were in Australia. No, no, no. This was one of my guests that was oh. making that comment. Wasn't there in Australia? Oh, okay. Gotcha. I mean, do yeah. I sound like an Aussie? No, but, you know, you had me a little bit confused there because <laughs> I think that I did a, a, you know, with my, I have a radio show, BUFO Radio. 
And it seemed to be years ago I actually I did a show with you. I interviewed yes. you. Yes, yes, it, w- it was a long time ago. Yeah, it's been many, many moons. Yep. But now we get to talk again, so it's all good. Yes, it is. Mary, I just want to jump right in because we have a lot of material to cover. Um, in your book, you talk about 26 six cities of, and I'm going to say, Akakor. Am I saying that right? Akakor? Right. Okay. Um, where are these cities and who built them? The ancient cities, you know. Well, Agricor is pretty much based on mythology, but a lot of, uh, you know, your, your, your facts come from mythology because at one point in time, history was just passed down, you know, orally, you know, until they were able to start, you know, writing. And then, you know, so now here we are today using even, now we're electronic. So, you know, communication, you know, evolves. But uh, Akakor was, um, uh, th- 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 these were cities of the gods. And, um, and it seems that um, at one point in time, going back to Atlantis and Lemuria, you know, the, the, the world was ruled by the, these gods, what they called gods. And I think that uh, it could possibly be, um, you know, what uh, Zechariah Sitchin speaks of, you know, with the Anunnaki. You know, that uh, the, the, there was um, these uh, star gods that came down from the heavens, you know, and uh, taught man you know, um, the, the sciences of their worlds. And, um, and so, but prior to, just prior to, you know, the, the great catechisms that hit the world, they left. And uh, they, they, left a, uh, they left information, material, you know, uh, behind, you know, with these uh, uh, keepers of the records, you know, so that, if anybody did manage to survive, they could, you know, um, start building again. <clears throat> and uh, there was a lot of people that did survive. And uh, it, and so this is where, uh, like with the red-haired giants, um, you know, I I wanted to show people that these these red-haired giants did exist. They had survived the catechisms, and uh, you know, and um, and basically they. Pretty much, rule. They, uh, you know, um, they they were found all over the world. But the red hair, the book, the red haired giants. This one here, because this is a book. I should say this is a series, and there's five books in the series. And with the red haired giants, this book, this is about Atlantis in North America. So pretty much I'm focusing with this book on the giants of North America. I guess what you're saying, and and I was a little bit confused, and so I'm just going to clarify my own little bit of confusion in reading in the book. You don't believe that the giants were the gods, but they were a race on the earth that the gods interacted with. Well, there, you know, even in Genesis, it, it speaks of the, the, the gods and then the sons of the gods and then the sons of the sons of gods. And then, you know, in Greek mythology, you hear about the Titans, you know, the, the wars of the Titans. Um, and so there, I think what we want to do, the people want to do is to put... You know, put everybody in one nice, neat little package, you know, and and tag them. And and I don't think that we should be doing that. I think that we should be seeing back then, in the past, in ancient times, people like what we have today, you know. And one of the groups of people were the red-haired giants. And oh, I... Oh, and go ahead. Were, yeah, and these were like a, a hybrid race, 
uh, that uh, had the, the the blood of the gods and also the gods of earth and the blood of of, of the men or the people of earth. So they were hybrids. Well, I mean, I don't try to put anybody into a group, and you know, my personal opinion is that there were multiple groups on the planet all living and interacting with each other at one point in time. So. Yeah. And uh, in the Adamic man, well, even Noah, in my book, I tell about Noah even being a giant. You know, people evolve, you know, and, and if, you, if you think about it, um, you know, even, you know, if you follow the, the Christian traditions, you know, back, way back when, the, when there was dinosaurs, everything was gigantic. The trees, the plants, the insects, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the everything. Why, in, in, in God's wisdom, why would he have created a man five foot four and put him into a world of everything being gigantic? And then saying, okay, you can rule the, you have rulership over this land and over, over the animals at five foot four. When he's looking at, you know, dinosaurs, you know, and the well, size then of let them. me ask you, you know, there are, in my opinion, two groups of giants that mythology talks about. There are the giants like the Titans who were as big as trees and as tall as mountains. And then we have the other group of giants, which were like the Goliath kind of giants that were, you know, seven to 12 feet. So which group are you talking about? Are you talking about the colossal giants or are you talking about those 10 footer giants? Well, uh, we found here in North America, you know, skeletal remains of, uh, of giants 15 foot, 20 foot. Uh, but uh, most of uh, the, the latter giants were the ones that were, you know, that uh, you, you hear more of that were like 10 foot, 11 foot, 12 foot. And uh, in my book on the red haired giants, I'm, I'm pretty much talking about the latter giants that had, you know, had um, decreased in size. Not so much that their DNA had changed that, or their blood had changed, you know, their bloodlines. It's just that everything started to decrease in size, including the giants. But that makes sense. You know, if there is just that, you know, that's happening across the planet for environmental reasons or food reasons or whatever the cause was at that time. Um, how long ago do you think the giants inhabited the earth? I think, well, actually, you have um, uh, recessive genes and you're still find, finding giants right today, modern giants that are 12, 14 foot. So we're, but they're very rare, but, um, you know, they're out there. Um, and then, of course, you just have people that are very tall. But, you know, uh, giants are more proportioned. Their stature is more proportioned to their height than just a person that's just tall. Uh, but it's a recessive gene. But I think that they, I think that you're probably looking at, um, Oh, um, I think everybody feels comfortable saying uh, 2,500 years ago, you know, but I think that we could actually take it back to, uh, you know, back to the cataclysms going back 10,500 years or even 12,000 years, you know, but right now, you know, most of the authors, they don't like saying that because, you know, they're trying to, they're trying to work among the archaeologists and the anthropologists as well, you know, and so they're very careful about trying to date things past 2,500 or 3,500 years. All right, I'm but, just going to tell you this, Mary. It's like my belief is that these gods were here for billions of years. Yeah. And so you can take it back as far as you like. 
because right. you are not going to get any slack from me at all. You know, and, and you're bringing up that date, but weren't the Native Americans from Asia or whatever, didn't they come and start populating the new world, you know, 13 to 20,000 years ago? And exactly. if that was the case, wouldn't they have interacted with this race of giants on a regular basis? And that's exactly what they did, and that's what the Red Haired Giants book is all about, is that when they did come, you know, migrate to North America, they found they found these red haired giants already living here. And they did interact and interbred, you know, for some time until, you know, how how mankind is, greed took over. You know, and my whole book is about how the they, you know the these the newcomers had decided to exterminate all the giants in North America, and um, and we um, in my book I actually you know use references I found old texts and Indian lore and you know you know where you know it actually confirms that this is true that uh, these people did live here and they were you know. If you take it back, you can find that these people were actually Atlanteans, you know, and uh, the Atlanteans were giants. And but anyhow, uh, when uh, they were attacked and um, uh, here in North America, they they moved, and uh, these people would have been the precursors to the Mayans and to the Aztec. And in my book, I tell about, you know, their migration into Mexico and then also down into Central America and uh, South America, you know, because they tried to be peaceful. They didn't want to war. And uh, so they avoided it as, as much as they could. So thus they would move and um, try to start up a new life, a new civilization elsewhere. But, Do you think um, there's... Do you think there's any relationship between these giants and the elongated skulls that they have found in South America? I most certainly do. I think that these are your elongated skulls, is these this ancient race of red-haired giants. Cool. And we've actually found, uh, we have found these, you know, you'll hear people talking about the elongated skulls being found in Peru in those areas, but we've found elongated skulls right here in Wisconsin and I have photos of them you know and the reports you know of these uh, skulls being found here Wisconsin. Wait a say that again you have found elongated skulls in Wisconsin yes I've actually got the pictures as well or do they still exist or have they just disappeared into someone's memory somewhere? Well, they migrated. Like I said, they were the, they, a lot of people know them as well as the mound builders. And uh, they migrated, you know, to avoid this new migration that came into North America, who were very warlike. Uh, they, they they moved. They left Wisconsin. Well, they battled for some time, but after a while, there was just it, it. It was they wasn't going to win the battle, you know, and they knew it. So what they did is they just packed up everything and they moved to Mexico, started the Aztec civilization, and then they also were the precursors to the Mayans. So. You'll hear the stories of them down there, you know, in Central and South America as well. But I've actually got pictures of these elongated skulls from Wisconsin, you know. One of them is, uh, is um, an archaeological jig, and um, the skull, or the entire skeleton, it's, the picture shows the, the people that did the dig, and then with the... And then the picture of the this uh, giant skeleton, you know, at the at the bottom of the grave, you know, at the base of the grave, and with the elongated skull. I would love to see that picture. So if you have it anywhere, I mean, you know, not right this second, but if you could post it on Facebook and tag well, me on it, I, I would I would love you for that. I know, but right now I'm still trying to get permission. 
you know, from um, uh, from the source so that I can get it up in public, and I'd like to have it in my next book as well. Okay. So I can't get that one up, but I do have pictures or skeletal um, or skulls of giants from Wisconsin, you know, that other people have posted, so I can get those up to you. Okay. I just can't. I just can't use that one until I get permission. Okay. And that's cool. I mean, I, I, I understand that and, you know, totally need to be respectful. Um, <clears throat> let's talk for a second. You know, you were talking about these gods that were here. So are we talking about the same gods like Enki and Enlil or Zeus or, you know, Indra um, that were sky gods that we hear about in mythology? Is that who you're talking about when you talk about these gods that interacted with the uh, red-headed giants? Right. It, uh, it, well, if you go back to uh, Lemuria, this is where this kind of all starts is, you know, pre-Atlantis. Because uh, Lemuria was in North America, and it was the motherland. And, um, you know, when the it was time for the Earth to be populated... They sent um, they sent uh, they sent two groups out of um, these teachers, these gods of wisdom, and they uh, they sent them east and they sent them west, you know, to develop these civilizations like in India and uh, in Europe. Um, well, and then of course on the west or be on the east coast, that would have been Atlantis. Uh, but anyhow, as they sent these teachers out, they gave them a name, which I thought was, um, I really liked because they, the name that they gave these great teachers coming from Lemuria uh, to reestablish these um, colonies uh, or civilizations, they called them Mayas, you know, <laughs> and that's the, so the, the word Maya actually takes you back to the days of Lemuria. So, pre-Atlantis. And then the, these Mayas were eventually uh, called Nagas. And of course, Naga is, you know, um, uh, that's a, like a reference to the serpent people. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, and and uh, so anyhow, you know, it, it, that it, it's very complicated, you know, because it's taken me five <laughs> books to write. Because, but what I'm trying to do is, they, I actually talk about like during the days of Atlantis, during these days when the redhead uh, giants were around, um, these people had flying ships. You know, they called you know they called them Vimanas. And they, you know, they were like, um, they could take them into outer space. They were like UFOs, what we call UFOs today. And they were be able to, you know, um, go from one place to another in a flash. So it was nothing for them to go from North America to India or wherever. And there's a lot of references to these Vimanas. And so the, these people were very, very civilized, you know, and high tech. You know, much more so than we are today. But. What I find interesting, and this isn't against to you or anything, but that in all of our investigations, we have not found any machinery. You know, other than rock structures that could have been some kind of machinery, we haven't found any high tech. Well, first of all, machinery, like let's say iron, it's going to rust. That's going to deteriorate. You know, you've got the big dead battery, you know, that managed to survive. But most of where you're finding evidence of these people are in these, uh, um, you know, the, the, these um, oh, uh, stone structures, you know, the megaliths, you know, the, the cut stones and... Um, and then people are actually finding things like in mining, they're, you know, finding different types of, you know, tools. But uh, it seemed like the rock was what survived. But if you put like a, a piece of iron out for 10,000 years, I mean, what's going to be left of it? Nothing. 
you know. But with the Vamanas, uh, they, you know, they found, you know, these um, these flying machines that they use. You can learn a lot about them in my book, or you could also, I got most of my information through the, or the Mahabharata, you know, the Vedic texts. But, um, you know, they have, they tell about how to even make them. And um, who really, you know, while we were all laughing about this, uh, Hitler took it serious, you know, and uh, and he sent troops up there into the Himalayas, you know, because they were supposed to bend some of these Vamanas still left, you know, hidden in these caves, along with a lot of uh, texts, you know, to, you know, to teaching people how to make them, how to fly them, you know, the whole thing, so... Anyhow, that's where, you know, and Hitler went up there with his people, well, he sent his people up there and learned about the viral energy, the viral energy, um, and, um, and how to make UFOs. And those UFOs was what the United States called, uh, you know, the soul, or the, you know, the pilots were calling them Foo Fighters. And you're, through the viral energy, this, is, uh, this was your atomic bombs. You know, so the stuff, you know, the information has always been there, but nobody really ever took time and effort to really go search it out. And um, you're not saying that Hitler was a good person, of course, you know, and what he did, but he did follow up on it. And um, Well, I mean, but I, I think in the West, we are so programmed and brainwashed into thinking that this is what our past was and there seems to be a concerted effort in not changing that opinion you know so talking about the manas that were made in some distant time you know time in the past just upsets the timeline it does, but notice how much money our governments put into looking for signals from outer space and how much they put into these secret projects, you know, for time travel and, you know, space travel. If they didn't believe it was possible, they wouldn't be, ma they wouldn't be spending all that money. But you know what I think, Rita, is if you ever notice, uh, the, and <clears throat> as far as grants go or any support goes it always goes to you know the the scientists uh, that want to study in other countries but nothing is really uh, but promoting archaeology you know study of our ancient past and and anthropology and all that uh, there, it's not promoted here for the United States they don't want you know, who they don't put any money into it. They don't allow people to go out there and look for, you know, evidence of, you know, ancient past civilizations. And I even think, in our own backyard. Yeah. I mean skip and somewhere I, else. Even in our own backyard. Yeah, and I think the reason for this, Rita, is because there's something here in North America they're looking for. You know, whether it be uh, the Ark of the Covenant, you know, who knows? It could be, uh, it could be more information, you know, on this high technology, you know, from the past. But there's something here that they are scared to death that we're going to find. And like you said, they, uh, you, you could have something in your backyard, and they're not. If you find something in your backyard, you have got to contact an archaeologist, you know, to to do the dig. You can't do it yourself. And if that archaeologist finds something important, he's got to contact another archaeologist and you know of a higher department. You know, I mean, it's crazy. You know, and well, I wouldn't not, be contacting anybody, but well, you well know. yeah, well, most people don't because they know what's going to happen. Uh, it's going to uh, be taken away from them. My uh, my husband's grandparents here in Boscoville, Wisconsin, they uh, they had a farm and they had all these. They had a they found a mound and uh, 
they contacted the local archaeologists there, and uh, they came in with a team, uh, roped it all off, tent, put tents up so nobody could see what was going on, and they did their dig. It, but the, with the promise that they would tell Brad's uh, <laughs> grandparents what they found. But when they dug everything up, they loaded everything on the truck, covered it up, and there was never, the, the grandparents were never told, you know, what they found, you know. Hmm. And that's pretty much how they do it. So people have gotten to the point where they find something, you know, they kind of like to dig it up for themselves to see what's there. But the penalty of doing something like that, I mean, you might as well murder somebody than do something like that because you'll probably get less time for murdering than you would be for, you know, finding these artifacts, you know, and digging them up and keeping them. But it was an accident. I was putting in a, a rose garden. Well, that's what I'd be saying. <laughs> You know. But I have to tell you, my, my late husband often speculated that North America was the land of the giant's race and that at some point in time um, they were eliminated. And yeah. so that when the current group of Native Americans came to this land, you know, there were still some that survived, but the populations that were here were greatly diminished. What's your take on that? Thought. I I think he's dead on, and that's what my that's what this uh, book, the Red Haired Giants, is all about. That's exactly what they're all about, and um, you know, they're like uh, in the um, down there in Texas. What is that the uh, that river down there where they have the dinosaur tracks? Oh, Glen and, Rose. Is that it? But yeah. anyhow, they got the. Um, uh, they had those giant footprints walking right next to the dinosaurs. And what did they say? But those were giant prints. They they tell people, yeah, okay, they are human prints. But they never give the size of those human prints. But those sizes were of, of somebody of gigantic structure. And they got, uh, they've been finding a lot of those uh, giant human prints walking next to, uh, you know, showing the prints along with the dinosaur prints in Arizona as well. You know, so, I mean, this is, as far as I'm concerned, and as far, well, even the Mahabharata, you know, the Vedic text, refers to North America by the name of uh, Pushkara. P-U-S-H-A-K-A-R-A. -A. <laughs> <laughs> it's I'm, Indian. I'm, You're yeah. good. Okay, but it's Pushkara. And... Uh, and they refer to Pushkara as the land of the giants, the land of the Nagas. And they talk about how the uh, Rama, you know, and, you know, the, the prince of uh, India, you know, uh, would fly here to North America and visit with the, you know, the king, you know, of the of the Nagas who were and describe them as giants that had magical powers. You know, uh, they were and called them the serpent race. And, you know, and, you know, it, it's there, you know, your husband's right. And I know I'm right. I'll never back down from it. I don't care how how intimidating <laughs> anybody is. I'm going to look them right dead in the eyes and say, no, giants existed. And they, they, their, their land that they, they called the land of the giants is right here in North America, you know. Well, and it even seems that when you question many of the indigenous populations, and this is even when the, uh, the Europeans first came and the Spanish first came, and they questioned the, the indigenous population about, you know, different mounds or whatever structures. And they may, would comment about, well, they were made by these people before us. And it doesn't seem like there is a recollection anywhere of who built some of the stuff that that is all over the United States. Right. And there and in the archaeological department, there is no interest in following up on it either, you know. And it's a shame, and I'm sure you're like me. You'll sit there and you'll talk to an archaeologist, you know, and they'll 
they deny it. You know, they just absolutely, re I mean, their minds are totally closed to any possibility of giants. You know, and that's not what science is supposed to be. Science, you know, science is supposed to have an open mind and explore possibilities. But the scientists, not the new ones so much, because I, I've noticed that the new science is starting to open up a lot more to possibilities. But, you know, uh, from the last several, uh, maybe from like the early 1900s up until, you know, 2000, something like that, they, they have been just so closed minded and just. They've just been very detrimental, you know, to the evolution of, you know, of, of man, you know, mm -hmm. because we need to know what our roots are. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, a, it's like a, 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 an orphan child, you know, when they grow up, you know, they're constantly looking for their parents, trying to find out what their parents were like, what type of diseases they may, you know, the, you know, be prone to, you know, because you need to know that. And, you know, and it gives you a sense of, uh, oh, uh, a sense, I don't know, a, it make I don't, I don't even know how to explain it, but it, you, you need that sense of being, you know, uh, the right to be here. And, and that's what having roots is all about. It gives you that, it establishes you, you know, and it... Um, you know, so it, like North America, the people in North America, they don't have no roots. You know, you ask people where they're from. Well, I'm, you know, my family's from Europe. My family's from Africa. My family's from Spain, whatever. My family's from Egypt. But nobody in all the other countries, they go back and they say, well, you know, ours goes back. Our people have been here for a million years or whatever. But see, here it's just like we're walking in quicksand here in North America. And I think that's the reason a lot of us are, you know, having so many problems, you know, you know, mentally mm -hmm. even, you know, because <laughs> we're like lost children, you know, we don't have roots. We need to get that back. We need to have our history back to us and take pride in who we are, you know. You know, Victor, you know, they always say history belongs to the victor, and that's how it always has been, you know. But it's finally gotten to the point, well, that's not funny anymore. You know, that, you know, we should, we should never change our history, you know, our traditions. That should have always been left alone. But, of course, it wasn't, and now we've gotten to this, this, uh, psychotic type of, uh, <laughs> of you know um, personality you know uh, globally you know because nobody knows who they are and they and they listen instead of researching and reading books and you know and learning on their own they they take the word of all these people that are lying to them you know, I always get a kick out of people, they'll say, like, with UFOs, they'll say, well, you know, why doesn't the government just tell us the truth so we can believe in UFOs, if they're really out there? You know, why doesn't the president tell us, or, you know, why doesn't the government, whatever. And it's just like, are you serious? You'd actually go to a liar to get a truth, you know? If, well, the people, if, they're li if these it. people are lying to you and they're constantly lying to you, you know, why do you think that you're going to be able to go up to them and hear a truth? You know, I've always been that way, though. If somebody lies to me, I don't trust them anymore. Mm -hmm. you know? I, but Hey, Mary. Yeah. I, I want to shift gears because we have a question from the chat room. Okay. And I want to make sure we get a chance to get to it. And this is from Marky. And he says, what about the pyramid in Rock Lake? Do you know anything about a pyramid in Rock Lake? Yeah, uh, Frank Joseph and I have been out there for the last five years. And uh, one time, now, one time uh, we had a large pontoon, a bunch of divers and all that. 
And this guy that works for DNR actually came out and he wanted to know what we were doing out there. We we're the only ones on the lake. And anyhow, and we told him we were looking for underwater structures. And he says, well, he says, uh, do you, he says, actually, he says, uh, we have mapped, the DNR had mapped out over 1,100 structures underneath the waters of Rock Lake. And he actually went back to, because we were out there on the lake, and he he had one of those little, I don't know, little boat things, you know, I, ski boats or whatever they're called. Anyhow, he he says, I'll show you. And he went back to his, he went back to his car and came back with a map, a DNR map of all the spots that they had marked, you know, of, of underwater structures. And we asked him if we could have a copy of it, and he just laughed, and he says, no. He says, you can't have a copy. I just wanted to show it to you. And he says, and we would never admit to the public that, you know, we found all these underwater structures. But, yeah, the, it it's amazing. We've been out there for, like, five years now. We usually probably go about, about do some serious diving about three times a year. But we actually found, uh, about five years ago, we found a pyramid. And it was the most amazing pyramid. We There was maybe about, oh, I don't know, nine people with us. And uh, Frank Joseph actually wrote an article in Atlantis Rising about it. But we went out there, we and we found this pyramid, and it, it looked to me like it was made out of obsidian. It was like glass. Um, there was no um, uh, algae or anything on it whatsoever. And... Um, and it had like these golden um, hieroglyphs, you know, at the at the tip of it or at the point of it, you know, the um, what the head or I can't the the, the capstone, but actually had uh, uh, golden hieroglyphs. And so we marked the spot because we were out of oxygen in our tanks, and so we marked the spot and. Um, and took some pictures, you know, uh, we didn't go under again, but we took pictures of the area so that we'd be able to come back and look at it. And it's gone. It's, you know, five years we've been out there looking for it, and we can't find it. That Rock Lake is the strangest lake you've ever seen. There are, things disappear and reappear on that lake. It's um, a real spooky lake. And um, we know. I mean, could it be like an interdimensional portal type thing that's, there? Well, that's what we're thinking because all the pictures I had when I looked at my camera, all the pit, you know, I had the pictures showing us getting on the pontoon, going out to that area, and then all the pictures I took of where the pontoon was, where that was sitting over this pyramid, all those pictures are missing. And then the pitch start up again once we get out of that area and we're about going back to shore. Well, it's like, where the heck did the pitchers go? You know? And we and it's not that big of an area. We had this marked, you know, landmarked. But no, but, but it's just, I mean, we spent hundreds of hours out there on the lake just, you know, back and forth scanning with the best equipment you could possibly think of. The only thing I can possibly think of is the currents down there. Maybe, you know, because there's a lot of muck and silt down there. Mm -hmm. And maybe the current took all that sand and silt and everything off of it just long enough for us to see it. And then when the lake changed over, the current comes back in a different way and covered it all back up with sand and silt. But that still doesn't explain where all the pictures went, you know. It's well, you know, and you do ghosty stuff. I mean, that's a pretty normal thing that happens in a high-energy, high-frequency zone. Yeah. And there's always been, um, there's always been uh, talks of, of big rocks that'll be there, you know, in several tons, you know, that people will dive off of, you know, on Rock Lake. And then it's and then one year that rock just disappeared, you know, 
Hmm. And they've looked and looked and looked for the rock, and it's not there. And there's other different landmarks, you know, that's, you know, on the lake that have just dis disappeared. So I think that it is an interdimensional portal, that lake is. You know, or where, and they had built, actually built a city there at one time, but when, when these, um, when these mound builders or, you know, these, uh, these red haired giants, when they, we, and we know they were red haired giants because we have stories about the giants going to battle, you know, back and forth. And there was, uh, this one, um, uh, bunch of giants over by, uh, Muscadet at Frank's Hill. There's a story about, because they had yellow hair, and they went to Lake Mills to fight with the red-haired giants, you know, in battle. And then they'll talk about the red-haired giants coming to Frank's uh, Hill and fighting the, the yellow-haired giants, you know. So, so we know, and then we also have, you remember what I told you about that elongated skull? Mm -hmm. We also have we've got we've got evidence of them through the the skulls, and then we also found a petrified um, uh, a petrified skeleton, you know, <laughs> near Rock Lake. So, which was a giant. So, you know, the, it, that place is really strange. But I'm sure that that's the reason that they chose to build there too. You know. Their, their ceremonial, um, you know, temples and that is because of the fact that it was there was a, a dimensional doorway there. So. so what do you think happened to the giants? I mean, you started to talk about it briefly, and then we kind of went off on another topic. Well, you know, there's been, well, of course, you know that in Deuteronomy, um, the Lord um, uh, gave the orders for Joshua to wipe out every giant, you know, along with their children, their dogs, and their sheep, whatever. Nothing was to remain. Their monuments were to be destroyed. There wasn't supposed to be anything ever left of them, of the, these giants. And, you know, a lot of people thought that they were just talking about that particular area. But in my book prior to this um, uh, in uh, what's called Lost in Time, I tell about this was uh, Joshua went around the world, him and his people went around the world exterminating these giants, you know, based on, you know, the orders of uh, Jehovah. And um, So he was Joshua were, the uh, giant killer? Yeah, they, <laughs> they were just wiped out, you know, they were exterminated, you know, it was a genocide. You know, and, um, you know, and some of them, the only thing that we really have left is the ones that are are born today with the recessive gene, you know. But um, so how much do you think of our gene pool has giant genetics in it? We have more here in North America than any other country, especially up in the Wisconsin area. Wisconsin and Michigan area. They were also known for their copper mining. You know, and you know, what we know about this is that, you know, like uh, there was uh, the great uh, cataclysms that hit, you know, uh, and submerged uh, Lemuria and Atlantis around 12,000 years ago. But how long did these civilizations, how long were they around prior to their submersions? I mean, they could have been around hundreds of thousands of years, a million years. We, I mean, we don't know. And right now, there's such a debate of just dating Atlantis or even a date of, did, or, you know, a debate whether or Atlantis even existed, let alone what type of people were in Atlantis. But if you go into the ancient texts, they all say they were giants, you know? Well, you know, if you go into the ancient texts, they don't really say that there were humans living anywhere. You know, right. humans were created, and usually it's kind of, in my opinion, it's usually kind of at the end of the story that humanity is created. So if humans weren't created till chapter 9... Then who's in chapter one through eight? Exactly. And, you know, and they don't go too much into Cain, you know. Uh, but 
you know, it shows, or well, it does in my books, that the, you know, that the Adamic man was created by the gods, but the 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 line of Cain was more of a hybrid, you know, um, and uh, that that was the it was the la the line of Cain that started the red haired race. And they were the builders uh, of the temples and the mounds and all that. Um, and so, you know, so, but we're bringing, we're trying to bring that all back around so that people understand that there was, you know, in uh, Arizona, I used to hear stories of the little people, you know, and the little people went into the mountains because of the giants that came upon the land. You know, so we got little people, we've got giants, we have blue skin people, you know, we have bird men, you know, we have Bigfoot, uh, you know, there's so, you know, and then we have interdimensional people, you know, that, and, and maybe, you know, maybe space visitors. There, you know, that's what I was getting at when we first began the show about tagging, you know, we can't. We can't fall subject to to tagging people and putting them into a box, you know, because there these races of people that was here, I mean, there were so many, you know, that the red-haired giants is one of many. And we get so caught up in arguing about, you know, who's who and what's what, we we get we forget about what we're even looking for, you know. But um, I think that right at this point in time, you know, the world is opening. It's like Christ, you know, I'm not really so much a Christian, you know, but I I was a Christian, so I, I remember the readings and that. But Christ said in the end days, all things shall be revealed. And I think that that's what's happening now, is everything is starting to unravel, and everything is becoming revealed. And and I think that it's just beginning. And I think that it is history. And when we find out what our roots are and the truth, I think that it's just going to be absolutely amazing. And I think that that's where when people will start having their freedom. You know, that that's when they'll start becoming self-empowered again. Once they know their roots and they know that they're stardust, that they come from the gods, you know, the line, you know, that they have abilities, magic abilities through their mind, use it, you know, using their thoughts, you know, it, and I think it's, you know, these government leaders, I think it just scares the hell right out of them, excuse my language, but, you know, and so they try to keep all this stuff from us, but you know, more, I have, um, in Red Haired Giants, I took almost a whole, well, it was a whole winter, I went through the archives, all the Wisconsin newspaper archives from the 17, well, early 1800s up until I, you know, few, up until now, uh, looking for articles of, um, of graves dug up, show, you know, of these giants. And I have one chapter that is nothing but these uh, newspaper articles of giants that they found in Wisconsin. Just in Wisconsin. Yes, Wisconsin. Mary, I'm looking at the clock, and I know the music is going to start here very, so very shortly. Um, if somebody wants to get a copy of the Red Haired, Red Haired Giants, where would be the best place to send them? Uh, to For that book, they can go right to Amazon and just type in the Red Haired Giants and Mary Sutherland. Or if they want any of my other books, or if they want the Red Haired Giants and want, want it signed, they can go to burlingtonnews.net slash uh, books, I think. <laughs> yeah, books. Burlingtonnews.net forward slash books. And they can order it through there, and I can sign the books and send it to them. Or they can just go to Amazon as well. But in my opinion, getting a signed book is priceless. 
Yeah, it is. It's yeah, and I always write. And I don't just put my name on it. I always write something, you know, kind of special for the people. I well, Mary, the, the music's rolling, which means we need to go. So thank you, thank you, thank you for coming on the show. Oh, it was fun. Thank you, Rita. Oh, well, you're you. welcome. I'll and you have you. a great evening and a blessed weekend. And I'll see you on Facebook. I follow okay. you. No. Okay. I Thanks. Do. All right. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. That is Mary Sutherland. Her book is Red Hair Giants. Her webpage is burlingtonnews.net. And then next week, very mixed bag, we have Barry Weinhold talking about, are you a 21st century man? And in the second hour, an extra special show on Just Energy Radio, we got, yes we did, Eric Von Daniken, Ancient Alien Evidence. Eric Von Daniken tells all, so don't miss it. Till next week, I'm Dr. Reed Louise. This is Just Energy Radio. Be blessed. Just Energy Radio. Point your browser to www.justenergyradio.com for more shows.